Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David Chinnery. I'm from Cornell Cooperative Extension in Rensselaer County, New York. And we're very glad to have you all here today. Uh, this is another one of our Lunch in the Garden webinars uh, that are offered free to the public. So um, we've been doing these for about two years now and we just don't stop. So it's a good thing. And we've had a lot of fun with it. We've covered a lot of different gardening topics. And a couple notes about today's program. Um, if you have questions, and we certainly encourage questions, you can type them down in the chat box. And Marcy, our assistant who is here today, and I will be keeping an eye on the chat box. And we'll ask Nancy those questions at the end. So stay, uh, stay along or stay tuned till the end and we'll answer all of your questions. Uh, the other note that I always like to tell people is that this will be recorded today and posted on our YouTube channel. So you can go over there and watch it again. And um, it takes us a while to do that, what's kind of a long involved process, but we will have it up there for you. Okay, so today's topic is growing vegetables in containers. And we have Nancy Scott, uh, one of our master gardeners here in Cooperative Extension uh, in Rensselaer County, and she's gonna tell us all about it. But first I wanna just mention a little bit about Nancy. Uh, she's a very avid gardener, a uh, very avid vegetable gardener, very knowledgeable. Uh, for a number of years, she was a teacher at the middle school, right? Goff Middle and, School. Yeah. Yes, Goff Middle School. And they had a large vegetable garden there. And she was a very big part of that project. Uh, getting young people to grow vegetables, which I think is one of the most fantastic things we can do in the world today, because uh, it teaches so many different lessons. Uh, Nancy has been a master gardener with us for a number of years. She's worked uh, quite extensively at our demonstration garden at the Robert C. Parker School. And she's also a volunteer for Capital Roots here in Troy and works at their, I guess we call that the farm, right? Yep. So Nancy, it's great to have you here. Uh, I think probably we can throw almost any vegetable garden question at Nancy today. So <laughs> I don't I'm know. Gonna, I'm going to offer it up that any kind of garden, vegetable yeah. garden question <laughs> we can throw at Nancy. So we welcome her here today, and uh, she's coming to us from a little bit down south, so we're lucky to have her here on Zoom. So thank you, Nancy. Okay, well, thank you. I didn't realize I'd get an introduction, but thank you very much, David, and good afternoon, and thanks for joining me. Okay, so we're going to talk about growing vegetables in containers, and uh, so when my husband and I sold our house and our big property seven years ago... Uh, what I missed most was my 30 by 70 vegetable garden, uh, downsizing to a small slip of land in an HOA controlled um, development. Uh, ended up with a lot of challenges. So what we did first was we built a, a large stone planter in a nice sunny location. And uh, this was to satisfy my addiction, of course, of growing vegetables. And uh, we've been adding an assortment of other things, other planters ever since. And I have probably have about 30 of them. And uh, most of them I'm growing vegetables in. So I'd like to help you get the most out of your container gardening. I know everybody does things a little bit differently, but these are the way that I, I've done them. So we're going to talk about these subjects. We're going to talk about the containers, the type of soil, the type of plants you might want to use, location, and the watering of these containers. So talk about containers. You can really, you know, use just about anything that you can, you know, get in your car and drag home or whatever you have around. Um, it depends on your overall color scheme. Uh, is it, is it a rustic look? Is it a, is it a, uh, uh, formal look, is it eclectic, you know? So here are some of my collection that are waiting there in the garage. So these have been taken uh, from all around the property. And this is my husband's way of storing them uh, for the winter. Well, some of them anyway. So the thing about a container though, is the bigger, the better. A bigger container is gonna hold more soil. It's gonna give the roots a lot more room to grow and absorb the nutrients. It's gonna help with uh, 
temperature fluctuations, it's going to hold the moisture in better. So you want to go for the bigger containers than you can. So if you had like a small clay pot out in the sun all day, you know what's going to happen. That pot is going to dry out and your plant is going to die eventually. So you want to make sure that you get the biggest planters that you can, depending on certainly what you're, you're going to put in it. So I'm going to talk about a few different types of containers. So these are, this is a cement planter. And um, these are really nice looking. Uh, they, they can be an important part of your landscape. Uh, after a while, they might develop a patina on them, a little greenish, maybe a little lichen on it or whatever, if you, if you like that look. Uh, you can also get them uh, stone like this, but they are very heavy. So once you put soil in there, they're pretty much there to stay. Um, you want to make sure that you have some drainage holes for there, though. Uh, next, I have these ceramic pots. These are really beautiful. The finish on them, there's lots of different colors, very vibrant colors. Uh, they are also heavy, and they are also uh, to the more expensive side, as well as the, uh, the cement uh, or stone planters. Those are pretty heavy and they're and the price is a, a little bit heavier. Uh, as in the stone or the uh, cement planters, you want to make sure that uh, you have drainage holes in them. Next we have some plastic type pots. Um, it's really hard for me to tell the difference between plastic, fiberglass, resin, polyurethane. They're all relatively uh, inexpensive and lightweight, um, unless there's a label on them. I really, I really find it difficult to tell the difference. But um, you want to go for sturdy yet flexible ones. And the one on the left that you see appears to be one that has a double wall to it. So that's an extra layer uh, to help, again, with temperature fluctuations. Remember, these are going to be out in the sun and also help with retaining uh, moisture. However, what you want to do is, again, you want it to be somewhat flexible because some thinner plastic ones are going to be uh, probably cheaper, but they might not last very long. I had one um, set of pots that I had that just basically lasted the season and then they ended up cracking. So here was something that I found very interesting. These were at a local big box store. And these are actually made from recycled plastic that was pulled out of the ocean. And as some of you know that we have this huge uh, mass of floating plastic and junk and all kinds of stuff in the Pacific Ocean, uh, probably twice the size of Texas now because 10 years ago it was the size of Texas. Um, I'm intrigued by them. They were very thin walled, however. And if you could see the picture there, they're didn't seem to be very sturdy, but I don't know, somebody could have ran over it with a cart perhaps, and maybe they are pretty good. Um, next, we have your traditional type of pot, which is your clay, uh, unglazed terracotta or clay pots. Um, I don't usually use these because again, uh, my vegetables are gonna be out in the sun. Uh, I also don't like the look where a lot of, when you're watering the plants, the water and the fertilizer or whatever will go through the, and kind of seep through uh, and cover the, the, the uh, pot. Uh, I don't happen to like that look, some people do, uh, but these will dry out and they also will not, um, uh, they're more prone to cracking. Uh, however, they're, that is the traditional, they do look, good. I think if you want to use them in the shade, uh, that might be a better better place for them. Because with the repeated waterings, again, they're, they're, going, to, they're going to show all those minerals on the outside. Oh. Okay. Now we have wood. Wood planters are uh, very popular these days. Uh, make sure that you get some that are, however, not made with any kind of treated wood. Uh, cedar or locust are a good wood because they are naturally um, rot resistant. Uh, however, these are actual whiskey barrels uh, that you see that they've cut in half. So I'm thinking that these probably would, uh, would be fine to grow things. And you don't want anything that's treated wood because the chemicals in that treated wood is gonna get into the soil and then up into the roots of your plant and you don't wanna eat the chemicals. These are heavy too. And um, 
when filled with soil, especially. And you're also going to want to be careful with your drainage, with drainage holes for those. Now, the last one that I have uh, that I'm going to talk about are uh, metal planters. And I've seen a lot of them. And unfortunately, I do not have a picture uh, on doing this presentation. This was a learning uh, experience for me. And I could not get a picture of a metal, big metal container uh, to show you. But however, uh, whenever I open my computer, I pretty much get dozens of pictures in all sizes and all shapes uh, whenever I'm trying to research something else. So uh, those pictures are out there. You might want to look yourself. Uh, I've never used the metal planters. Somehow uh, the idea of having a thin walled metal thing out in the sun all day uh, leads me to believe that it would dry out and um, certain vegetables that you'll be growing like lettuces and things, they really don't like that hot uh, soil. So uh, it's something that's very popular these days because of the industrial look. Uh, I haven't used them. So if, uh, if you have, let me know what, uh, what you think of them. Then we have these fabric bags. Um, they kind of look like felt, but they're really uh, a type of plastic material, some of them are. And uh, they come in lots of different sizes. And uh, you see they have, some of them have handles on them. I tried to try using some of them for ceramic planters that did not have any um, drainage holes in them and I didn't wanna drill a hole in it. Uh, they work okay. I, I, as long as they're in something else, I like them, having them out just out uh, doesn't go with uh, you know, my aesthetics, but a lot of people swear by them and really like using them. Uh, again, they could be, with the handles, they could be moved if you have an issue with um, sunlight. So you can move them uh, pretty much anywhere you want. Okay. So whatever pot uh, or container that you're going to use, you must have some kind of drainage. Very important. You don't want the plant to sit there with its roots in water. So you have to uh, drill some kind of holes into the plant. Uh, on the internet, there's all kinds of numbers for different things. Uh, I've kind of just pulled some of the numbers from some of the sites. So a medium sized pot, about a 12 inch pot. I don't think I would use anything smaller. You should have at least three half inch holes. Uh, larger, larger pots, probably 16, or 18 inch diameter should have at least five one inch holes. And you wanna use some sort of a um, electric drill, get your drill bits, put something to protect your eyes and drill the holes in there. Some of the uh, thinner plastic pots uh, sometimes have little spaces, in, a little indents where you can just maybe take an awl or uh, uh, some other sharp sharp object and punch the holes in there just so that you have a, a good amount of drainage. I, I think that's really a very important thing. So if you had more holes, I don't think that would be an issue. It's if you just had one hole in there, I think that would, that would not be enough and you'd end up with, uh, especially with these big heavy rains that we get. So if you're placing your pots on a deck or a, a patio, uh, I end up putting these, uh, saucers underneath. And uh, originally I was buying the ones on the left, the, the thin ones, the clear ones, and they're, you know, they're very cheap and um, easy to use to put underneath pots. Uh, they go with, you know, pretty much any decor because they're clear. Uh, however, they don't last very long. They're a brittle plastic. And uh, I found, you know, especially if you're lugging a big filled pot and you're trying to located on top of that, you know, you could catch the edge and crush it or whatever. So uh, I started going over to the ones on the right, which are uh, a more of a resin, thicker plastic. They're, they're, they're actually easier to clean because if you look on the one on the, uh, on the left, they are, um, they are, uh, get all those little holes in there. And you do want to clean these well before you put them away uh, in the fall. So if you're not going to use, uh, use these and you might perhaps want to put your planters or your containers right on the soil or right on the mulch, 
you wouldn't need to use these. And actually, I would recommend uh, putting a bigger pot right on mulch if you're going to plant something like tomatoes or squash that have uh, really deep roots because they'll grow through and they'll get an extra um, an extra boost from that uh, from those roots. So here are uh, my pots waiting again in the in in the fall. I did clean out everything out of those pots, uh, all the roots, uh, any leftover foliage, anything in there, any bugs that I saw in there that they get cleaned out and the pots are left out to dry, hopefully long enough to dry. And then my husband has devised this way of stacking them so that um, we can fit the car in the garage. Um, and here's some of the really big pots that we had that we were taking in and out. And finally we realized, well, that's ridiculous. You know, we don't want to break our backs. So what uh, we have here is these are completely filled with soil. So what my husband does in the fall is he takes a, a pot from a hanging basket. Uh, we've cleaned those out. There's nothing left in it. He turns it upside down. So you could see that it's bowed like this. Um, and then he uses some tarp material and uh, bungee cords. And we have a very windy site and these hold up very, very well. Uh, it keeps the water out and the snow and the snow just melts off of them. So we don't have to worry about uh, freezing and thawing as much with these. Uh, okay, so we'll move on to, oh, my last is you can plant in anything. And here's a lovely, lovely boat that we saw uh, off of Long Beach Island, New Jersey this summer. I just thought that was great. I'm sure there's some kind of drainage there though. I have a feeling that the bottom of the boat probably uh, rotted out perhaps. Okay, so now I'm onto soil. So soil is actually the most important part of the equation here because you're growing your plants in this soil. Okay. And all the root systems are going to appreciate a good soil. What you don't want to use is soil from your garden. Okay, just regular yard soil. It will pack down in the containers and it will negatively affect the results that you'll have. Container gardening really requires a nice, light, fluffy garden soil. Uh, this promotes good air circulation. Yes, we do need air spaces in the soil. Uh, better drainage and better root growth. And the roots are really important to this plant. It's gonna keep it there in the pot and it's gonna give it, get, get all the nutrients that the top of the plant needs. So your regular garden soil, you know, contains lots of large creatures and little small creatures. You have worms, you have beetles, you have bacteria, you have fungi, and those all work together in your garden soil, in your garden, in the ground. Uh, and they help create air spaces and, and spaces for water. Um, and that's great for in the ground. So there's a whole food web going on there in the, in the ground. However, the soil that you're gonna put into this pot doesn't have all that action going on. And if you're starting to throw some garden soil in there, you're gonna be possibly throwing in some pathogens, okay? Things that you really don't want in there that are gonna rot your plant or cause disease. Uh, the other thing that for sure you're going to introduce is lots of weed seeds, probably thousands of them. So don't use all regular garden soil. Now we have this little um, graph here and you could see that this is what soil should be that's in the, in the ground. You could see that most of it is minerals. You have a little bit of organic matter. And then you have, look at that, 50% is, or roughly 50% is air and water. And I noticed that there's that little uh, arrow there because that's going to fluctuate depending upon certainly if you've watered it or if you've not watered it, uh, how much, but you do need to have space for the roots to breathe. And so you do need that air space in there and you do need the uh, space for water. So that's why you're going to get some nice light fluffy soil for these things. So if you're filling just a few uh, containers, then probably buying something like this, one of these potting mixes, 
Um, these, I'd, I'm not advocating using these. I just have to see them in, in, in the store and I took pictures of them. Um, this is probably your best bet, but make sure that you're using something called a potting mix, okay? I happen to have this really large pot and it took quite a while for us to figure out, well, for me to figure out what the best solution was to, I didn't want to fill that <laughs> with, with the dirt. Um, I tried lots of different ways. Uh, actually, I did use one of those uh, fabric bags in there uh, that was on top of a goop bucket that was kind of, uh, it didn't work for me. So eventually I tried filling it with other things and that didn't work. And now I just have it filled with soil and you saw that we put the top over it, we don't move it. So that's working pretty well. So if you're familiar with uh, square foot gardening, you know Mel has a formula for how to fill the beds up. You could use something like that. Um, this Farmer's Almanac uh, website calls for using uh, two gallons uh, each of peat moss, perlite, compost, garden soil. Yes, there is some garden soil, but notice that there is way more in relation uh, ratio of uh, peat moss, perlite, and compost there. The other things are uh, the dolomitic limestone, the soybean uh, meal, all those things are really uh, a type of a fertilizer. Uh, you can find lots of different soil mixes on there. I if you're filling a lot of pot, pots, that's what you're gonna to wanna to do. Here's another mix that I found using um, coconut coir, peat moss, sphagnum moss, perlite, vermiculite, compost, and then you have a slow or time release uh, fertilizer and, and the sand. So the coconut coir is something that is uh, becoming much more available now that people are eating a lot more coconuts. You have coconut uh, milk and you have coconut water and you have coconut uh, oil. So all those things, uh, there's a lot, uh, it's a good way to use up uh, the out, outer part of the coconut and it, and it has a good um, ability to absorb water. And what I do though, is I use, this ratio of, I usually buy pro mix because I use that to start my um, plants inside, my tomatoes and other things inside. And so I have a big bale of it, big bale of that pro mix. So I use some of it to start my plants. I'm gonna use that. And also I will use about two thirds of that mix with a third of uh, compost. And uh, I like to use, um, Mudu, which is composted uh, cow manure from Vermont, what could be better? Obviously you can use any kind of compost that you would like to use. So I reuse my soil from year to year unless I have a diseased plant. In that case, I would take the plant, the soil, put it in a, in a bag and, and toss it. Uh, wash and sterilize that pot so I could use it again. Uh, and this happened only to me once. So I've I haven't had an issue with, uh, with my soil. So in the spring, what I do is I take out about half of the soil out of each of the pots and some of it gets dumped into the big stone planter that you saw initially, you'll see it again uh, because it's very, again, very windy and I lose a lot of soil. So I, the rest of the soil that doesn't fill that planter, I mix in a wheelbarrow, a tarp, a cart of some sort, and um, I mix in the Moodoo and the Pro Mix, whatever brand you want to use, go right ahead. I just happen to use those. I'm sure there's plenty of other really great brands out there. I know we're not supposed to talk about brands, but that's what I use. Uh, I've even experimented with mixing in some um, fertilizer or putting fertilizer, especially something like a tomato plant that's going to have deep roots, I will put some fertilizer in the bottom of the pot, towards the bottom of the pot, and then fill, uh, backfill it with the soil because as the roots grow down, they're going to they're going to hit that uh, fertilizer. Uh, other plants, I just mix some slow release again, slow release uh, fertilizer in uh, to the soil. Now you've got it all mixed up, uh, whatever you're putting, whatever uh, 
soil you're going, soilless mix that you're going to use, um, and you want to moisten the soil before you put it in the pot. So that's why you have it in a tarp or a wheelbarrow or a cart of some sort. So then you can spray the water in there. You can let it um, soak up. It's going to take a little while because a lot of these mixes are, are very dry or they should be dry when you when you first get them. And so you're going to put the hose in there, mix it up, let it sit or whatever. It's a lot easier than trying to um, get the water. Once you put that soil in your, in your pot, sometimes you'll put the water there and it'll just go around the sides and drip out the bottom. So moisten the soil first. And the other thing that you wanna do is you wanna see if, um, if you're using new pots, you wanna make sure that you have uh, your drainage holes. Okay, remember those drainage holes? Um, some people, again, want to save on the on using the, the soil. They'll put things like uh, broken crockery in there or pebbles or styrofoam peanuts. I've tried those. Pottery shards, I've tried those. Or other material in the bottom, again, to, to take up some of the volume on some of these bigger things. Uh, I don't do that anymore because so when you're changing out some of the soil, you'll end up with it. you got to pick, pick it out. Um, I've actually also read some sites say that putting something like uh, pea gravel or something uh, very small like that in the bottom is actually going to keep the water from draining out. So it's recommended not to do those. So what you could do is maybe use some kind of covering for the drainage holes. Uh, again, if you're not using the saucers, you might want to put something there just so that you could keep the soil from dra from, uh, from kind of getting out when you're when you're uh, first watering it, and uh, you could put some sheets of newspaper over it, which eventually they're going to break down. But initially, they'll help uh, help with uh, keeping the soil from coming out. Uh, you could try some uh, permeable landscaping fabric. Uh, again, it has to be permeable, which means that the water is going to be able to drain out of it. Uh, and uh, recently at one of our master gardener meetings, one of our master gardeners, Kathy uh, Welling, did an excellent presentation on uh, jumping worms. So we had a discussion about that. So if you have a problem with jumping worms, if you don't know anything about them, good for you, but find out about them. Um, but this might be a way to keep them out of the pots. So you might take some screening material and put it at the very bottom covering those drainage holes, and then put your soil in there. Uh, make sure you fill the containers up to the very top because with all this mixing, you've incorporated again a lot of air in there. And by F day two, I'm sure it's gonna sink down a little bit and you're going to end up uh, with enough room for you to be able to water the plant or maybe even put a little um, uh, mulch on the top. So I mentioned that I added some fertilizer to the mix. Um, if you're using a soilless mix, there's nothing in there really. Uh, there's no nutrients in there. So you don't want to starve your plants. So you do need to fertilize. Um, you can mix fertilizer in with, uh, as suggested, uh, with, um, with the soil. Uh, however, most of the time, I just like to have a little bit of fertilizer in there to, to get the plants going. You really want it to develop the roots. You don't want to encourage too much growth up here because you want the roots to root the plant there, stabilize the plant. I do fertilize once a week. Uh, I use, either use a, um, uh, a water-based fertilizer, something like a filth fish emulsion, uh, emulsion mixed into your watering can um, or some kind of an organic slow release fertilizer. You can just spray uh, spread a little bit on the top of the soil, scratch it in. Uh, it depends. I can't tell you exactly how much to use because it depends on the size of the pot. It depends on the type of plant. Some plants are really uh, very heavy feeders, particularly tomatoes, um, and they need a lot more fertilization than some other plants that uh, there's are happy not having as much. And with tomatoes, actually, I also uh, use a, a week 
solution of something that uh, contains calcium, magnesium, and, and iron. Uh, and this helps with blossom end rot and some other issues that tomatoes are want to have. Okay. Um, so moving on to the plants. So now you have your beautiful pots. You've mixed up all this uh, beautiful uh, soil, nice light fluffy soil, or you put some in from a bag, however you want to do it. Um, and you're ready to plant. Uh, hopefully you haven't just come from the uh, garden center with, you know, you've been seduced into buying all these plants. I know right now it's probably snowing up where you are and you just want to see green things and you go to, you know, in another three or four weeks, you're going to go to the garden centers and you're going to come back with all these plants. Um, growing in containers really requires some pre-thought and some research because the varieties that you choose can make a big difference. So here I have a picture of, um, you know, a seed seed packet and you could see that this is brandywine pink uh, an heirloom variety pay careful attention to the back of the package now unfortunately uh on the back of the package there that you see there's a, a red um strip up at the top right unfortunately uh my slide is not very clear but what it says up there is indeterminate variety that's an important piece of information for you to have uh, going down, we also have, uh, you know, that it should be in full sun. Uh, if you were planting this, the, um, the seeds, we also have spacing uh, 18 to 24 inches. Well, how many plants do you think you could fit in one pot that's 24 inches? Okay, there should also be some information, perhaps, uh, depending on the variety, about um, disease resistance and, and other information that you might find. Uh, so you, if there's not enough information on there, uh, I would use my phone. I just look that up and see what it's gonna say. Uh, then we have these, if you're buying plants instead, um, you again would look at the label. Hopefully it does have the name of the variety on there. If it just says tomato, I would, I would go someplace else. Um, you should have the variety. It, there should be a lot more information on there uh, besides trying to sell you miracle Grow. Um, so we see that we're supposed to have lots of sun. Again, here, there's a spacing. This was an indeterminate uh, variety. And I'll talk more about indeterminate and determinate varieties in a minute. Uh, there's some information here about planting. Again, I would look up uh, the varieties beforehand and see what varieties are going to do really well in your, uh, in your pots. So here's another uh, nifty table that I found uh, from learn.eartheasy.com. Uh, this isn't the whole table, but uh, you can see that there's some things that, that will grow well in shallow uh, containers. Uh, lettuce and arugula, can, you could do them in six to eight inch containers. They would have no problem. Uh, something like different kinds of beans, beets, and kale. You really want something that's at least 18 inches. And then certainly things like winter squash and uh, tomatoes really need something much deeper. So for an example, so here's a planter that I have, and it's really not that deep. If you look at the bottom part of it, that's really kind of a molding. It's, it's only probably about nine inches deep. And my lettuces uh, do great in that. Something like chard, however, which I planted one year, did not like it. Chard needs, needs uh, more room. So here's a cucumber plant. Some cucumber plants have uh, tap roots three to four feet deep. Um, so you want to look for a variety that, uh, a bush variety perhaps, or a variety that uh, might not need that much room because again, you're, you're, you're probably limited with your room. Uh, and tomatoes are the most widely grown crop. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about them. They're, they're very popular. As you know, it's nothing like picking a ripe tomato that's warm from the sun and eating it, ah, right? That's wonderful. It, it's coming folks. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the two different types of tomatoes here, which basic types anyway, it's determinant and indeterminate. So determinate tomatoes, 
usually get to be, uh, or bush tomatoes is the other name, determinate or bush tomatoes, get to be about three or four feet high in the ground. And they can grow in a medium sized pot, medium to large size pot, uh, 18 inch diameter. And they don't require staking usually because they're very bushy. Uh, there is a dwarfed uh, bush variety called uh, patio. And you've probably seen these in the, just about anywhere. Supermarkets sell them, uh, big box stores, nurseries or whatever. They're, they get to be only two feet high. So that is a determinate type, special type variety is patio. I've never grown them, but doing research, I read about it. Uh, the thing with, they will produce in that 12 inch pot, but determinate tomatoes, all the tomatoes ripen in about two weeks time, and then the plant is done. So if you want it for canning or something, that might be a good thing because they're, they're all ready to go. Um, but if you want to have tomatoes over a longer period of the summer, then you're going to want indeterminate tomatoes. Now, the thing with indeterminate tomatoes, however, is that most of them get to be very big. They keep growing. Uh, they could grow some of them to 12 feet high. And um, of course, they probably won't get that big in a two foot deep pot, but be aware of it. So here are two different varieties growing against the south wall of my house there. So the one on the uh, left side is actually called a compact indeterminate. So it's indeterminate in that it's going to keep producing flowers and fruit over the whole season until frost or until I rip the plant out. Um, but it's compact. It's not going to get really, really big. That is a white schnicks Ukrainian tomato, and it grows a big tomato, uh, very tasty, sometimes a little strange looking shaped, but excellent. The one on the other side on the right is a sun gold tomato, and those will get really, really big. Uh, and that's a little uh, cherry tomato. So you could see the dip, and that's a indeterminate, and indeterminate tomatoes will grow really big. So if you have a limited amount of space, you want to consider uh, all of those things. The other one other thing that I want to say about the labels is also that uh, a lot of them will include it, hopefully will include uh, information on disease resistance. Um, just one other fact there. Okay. Or you can experiment, you know, you can try different things. Uh, you can learn from your successes and your failures. I mean, that's really what I've been doing. And I will tell you certainly about the failures. Um, so one very important part of this though has to do with spacing. So if you've um, done ornamentals and annuals in pots, you know the uh, thriller, filler, spiller idea. Uh, last year, uh, one of our master gardeners, Denise Maurer, did an excellent presentation on container gardens, and she uh, actually spent a lot of time talking about more ornamentals than, than fruits, uh, uh, than vegetables. Um, it's beautiful. It's an instant garden. If you can go back and, and look at that, you get some good, great ideas on that too. However, if you want to get the most from your vegetables, don't crowd them. Now I know that this poor little tomato plant, it looks so sad in that pot, doesn't it? And it's gonna look like that for you know a couple of weeks till it gets going, but then it's gonna eventually, it's gonna look like that in a very short time. So I've tried interplanting with different things. I've tried interplanting with alyssum, but either the alyssum takes over or the other plant takes over. Um, not sure how many other, what other things I would want. These are not vegetables, but these are two pots that have about the same volume of uh, soil in them and they are, get about the same amount of sunlight. And so the one on the right has the alyssum and lanterna. And we had a very, if you remember last uh, summer, we had some a lot of rain, <laughs> a lot of rain and crummy weather. Well, that alyssum went crazy. It really enjoyed it but the lanterna did not. So on the other side, you could see the lanterna that was just one plant, lanterna put in there. And um, 
Without the alyssum, boy, did it do well. Uh, here I have some of that uh, kale that I started, and I thought, well, I'm going to try the, the purple alyssum. Maybe, you know, that might do well because it'll be kind of the understory plant, and then maybe it'll grow over the side and it'll look really pretty. That eh, didn't do that well. And then uh, those three kale plants were really too much for that pot. Uh, eventually, it, um, it really got kind of crowded in there, and, uh, you know, you have... Uh, your cabbage moths come in and it was really hard to find uh, find those and, and, and deal with them. So again, I think in that big, even in that big pot, I think one plant uh, is all that you really need. Here's one seed, a zucchini plant. And um, I had zucchini, uh, enough of zucchini. It, it wasn't crazy again, because we had a lot of rain and I think uh, that had to do with the pollen, uh, the fertilization of the flowers, but that's just one plant. And here we have uh, years ago uh, where I tried putting zucchini in this pot, which is a pretty nice wide pot, but notice the sides, how it slopes down. There's not enough room for a root to really, the roots to grow really well. And the other thing with this pot is it has a built-in um, uh, saucer kind of a thing on the bottom. And uh, it's once that fills with water, it's kind of hard to get the water out of there without, you know, making a big mess. So uh, for lettuces and spinaches and those kinds of things, uh, this is arugula. I don't buy plants. Seeds are much cheaper. And to me, they're more fun. Um, I take about a, a one foot area at a time and I just sow the seeds, sprinkle a bunch of seeds in there. And then in two weeks, I'll sow another section so that I constantly have lettuces or greens over the, over the growing season. And when they get to be about this big, then I go in and I will just cut them off like that and um, eventually space them out. So they will uh, grow to a, a better head size, say. Uh, arugula, as you know, tends to go to seed, but um, it, when it gets hot, but I get some little greens here and um, throw them on a salad and it makes you feel like you're, you're getting something out of it, especially early on. Uh, here's an, another great thing that you can uh, grow are herbs. This is the herbs on my steps to my uh, sun porch. And um, you can grow all kinds here. Um, I had, uh, talking about spacing. So you could see that there is some uh, thyme and there's also some oregano. Originally when I bought the plants, you know, they're cute little plants in a little pot. And I said, well, they, you know, they don't need a big pot. And I put them together in the same pot. And within two years, the oregano had taken over and was kind of choking out the thyme, which is on the bottom right. And um, so I split them up and they're, they're very happy. They're doing great. This is also a great way to grow mint, any kind of mint, you know, if you put that in your garden, uh, it's going to, the roots are going to spread all over the place and you're going to end up with, with way too much uh, mint coming up. So this is a great way to grow, to grow mint as well. Okay, another, talking about the location that I have here of my, uh, right off the steps here. Fruiting plants need at least six to eight hours. And I say at least the more, the better. Um, if you want to have tomatoes, if you want to have um, anything, again, that pr produces fruits, eggplant, peppers, uh, beans, you need to have at least six to eight hours of sun. If you don't, the plants are going to get very spindly and they're just not going to produce enough. Uh, this planter where I have these lettuces, uh, and this, by the way, was before I came up with the idea of planting one foot section at a time. <laughs> you see how much lettuce I had all at one time? Anyway, this planter is located, uh, it doesn't get sun in the morning. It doesn't, the sun doesn't come in there until just after noon, even in, um, even in the summertime. And the, these plants do great in this location because they're not fruiting, uh, again, they're, uh, they're greens. Um, everything 
The greens do well here. Chard does not. Chard uh, did not like it here. Uh, not, not enough sun and also not enough uh, space for the roots. Chard, chard actually has a pretty big, pretty big root system. So everything in this uh, raised bed, bed planter gets um, sun all day long. And here we have, uh, this is an early spring planting. You can see I have garlic that came up from last year. I also have some tomato plants that I put in. Um, by the time the garlic is out of there, the tomato plants, it, it all works. Um, and you could see at the bottom right is one plant and that happens to be a sun gold tomato plant. At the main problem with having them out here, uh, the tomatoes out here, is that it is very windy. And this is what happens when a sun gold plant, an indeterminate plant, um, goes crazy. And uh, if you could see, there are a whole bunch of different things trying to hold that plant up there. I mean, there, there are all different things internally inside that plant that I've tied up to, but... Uh, First of all, it just got too crazy. I had to climb up and, you know, to pick them, which was great, but um, it just wasn't that pretty. So this location is not good. I mean, the plants like to grow in it, but really it's, it's not the best spot. So um, against this, this side, again, you see this picture, here's the south side. It's more protected here. The plants don't get as big, certainly, because uh, they don't have as much room but uh, the root systems don't have as much room as that big stone planter, but they do better here. Uh, I also don't wanna plant things in the same space um, every year, uh, especially things in the same family, like tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, they're all in the nightshade family and uh, a lot of the same pests and diseases affect them. So I try not to put them in the same exact location, although, you know, obviously I can't space things out too far because I just don't have that much room. But I do try to do sort of uh, an idea of uh, crop rotation, if you will. Also, another type of rotation that you might want to do is if you have plants that are way close up against the wall, you might want to rotate them if possible, uh, a quarter turn every week, uh, this helps with the air circulation and also helps with, you know, getting a nice um, uh, bushy plant. Uh, and certainly if your plants are getting very leggy, then you know that they, are, you know, stretched out, then you know that uh, you're not getting, in, they're not getting enough sun. If they, uh, the leaves are scorching, perhaps they're getting too much sun and that's usually, you know, afternoon sun, that's, that's kind of the culprit. Uh, and knowing the mature size of the plants, going back to those labels or the seed packet or your, uh, your computer or your phone or whatever, looking them up can help when you're, when you're locating these plants. So um, you wanna make sure that they, they are all getting enough light, they're not um, blocking any other plants. So I have some green beans there on the right. Uh, to the left of them are some escarole plants. There's the cucumber, which I decided to use a trellis to try again to try to help with the air circulation there. There's also uh, uh, chard in that bed. And then there is the behemoth zucchini plant, which I really thought I was going to put other things in there as well, but the zucchini just took over. Uh, Here's one of my favorite pictures. These, these peppers do really well up here on the wall. When I had the pot down below, uh, they just didn't get enough sun. So they did really well here. And over the, the rest of the summer, the hydrangeas um, kind of took over there. So sometimes I would have to, this was one of the pots I did turn because I wanted it to get a little bit bushier. So uh, I would turn these like I said, a quarter turn or so um, each week. Usually when I when I fertilized and I tried to fertilize, I should have said this before, but I usually try to fertilize on a uh, Monday, uh, hopefully not when I have, you know, gonna have guests over. So after the weekend, uh, because the fertilizer can be, can be kind of stinky. And then here was that big pot uh, that, I, that I've talked about that I've, this time it did not have all the dirt in it. 
again, this was another year when I hadn't put all the dirt in it. Um, and these are some acorn squash. And actually I did have a couple of acorn squash. My idea was that it was gonna be overflowing. Um, and I'm gonna try that again, uh, now that I have uh, the thing full of dirt. And then we have the issue of trying to keep all these plants nice and moist. So once you've settled your plants into your new home, uh, don't forget to water them. Um, try to keep the water off of the leaves. Uh, water at the base of the plant a little at a time. You know, don't put the jet spray on your on your on your spraying wand or whatever. To, to you want it nice and slow. You want it to be able to sink in. Uh, you don't want to wa wash the soil away, or you don't want to spray any of the soil up onto the under leaves of the of the plant. Particularly tomato plants really don't like that because you're going to introduce um, diseases and, and, and other things that uh, pests that you don't want to the plant. So you wanna keep the leaves dry, actually. My lawn irrigation system actually um, uh, goes into that part of that patio area. So I don't use that because it just drenches all the leaves. Some of the water drips into the planters, but mostly, um, the leaves just get wet and it just isn't going to encourage things. So I, I turn that, that off. Um, so again, you wanna keep um, the water away from the leaves. So with those 30 containers that I have uh, and the stone planter, I have a lot to water. So we set up a watering drip system for most of the plants. So, these are just ones that I found in a big box store. Uh, there's lots, you can get them online, you can get them in any good garden center. Uh, so you want a timer. And uh, you also might want this Y connector so that you can connect your, um, this part to your faucet at, at home, your spigot at home, and then you can run one side for the, for the irrigation system and one side for a hose. Uh, uh, the drip systems will come with lots of different hoses and fittings, uh, depends on the size of your pot. Uh, and that's, you kind of would have to kind of play with that. I couldn't really get into all those details right now, but there's plenty of YouTube videos out there, which will explain it in great, great detail uh, and walk you through uh, what you have to do. Uh, I do have a different size timer on that. Uh, they do run by battery and you put the battery in, in the in the spring and it lasts, you know, lasts for the whole season. They are very easy to work with as long as you have it in a location um, that is convenient uh, for you to, to change things. Last year, uh, it was a, oh, I would say at least a month and a half where I had no irrigation on at all because we just had too much rain. So here's that, that um, planter that I use for lettuces. And you can see right down the middle, perhaps, you can see uh, one of the tubes going, and then there's some side tubes as well. Then uh, I have this pergola. And um, so to the right is where the spigot is, again, uh, where the house is. And uh, so we've got the bigger uh, uh, tubing or hose uh, that goes up and we've got it attached with some zip ties. And then it goes into the big stone planter to the left. Uh, and here's the big stone planter in one of the times in the spring with some garlic coming up and an overplanting of radishes, way too close. Um, and here I have some peas. And again, there you could see a, a tube coming off and going in here um, to water those peas for me. So how much water and when to water is kind of different for each garden. However, water in the early morning, it's beautiful out there. Bring your cup of coffee, bring your cup of tea, whatever, and listen to the birds sing and enjoy the, the sun coming up. Water early in the morning. Uh, for those few times when it really gets very hot and dry, uh, over 90 degrees, you might need to water in the late afternoon, but never ever in the evening. You don't want those leaves, you don't want the moisture to sit there. 
Um, you don't want, you don't need to water uh, just automatically. It's a good idea to, you know, put your finger down into the soil a good two inches or so and see if it's still a little bit moist. You really don't have to worry about watering it. Um, you want the soil to, uh, to dry out at times. Um, the top part of the soil, it's okay to, to do that. Uh, so those timers are easy to change. So if, you know, you could, you could set it up to water it five o'clock in the morning and, um, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday or something, you know, however you want to do it, there's, there's lots of different ways and it, it's going to take a little while to, uh, to do that. That's certainly if you have a lot of, a lot of gardening. And certainly if you have those saucers under the uh, plants, that's another indication of how much water has gotten into there. If, that, if there's a lot of water in the bottom that you know you definitely don't need to water again. So what are some of the benefits of container gardening? Okay, first thing is I don't have to spend much time weeding. Now this is a good healthy dandelion weed. You see that root on the bottom? You're not gonna find those in your, in your container plants because it's, the soil is so nice and fluffy. You're gonna see that, you're gonna see that um, dandelion trying to come up and you just be able to pick it right out. You won't have to dig it. This, this took me a while to dig out. And um, so you're not gonna, all that time I spent when I was um, uh, weeding that big, huge garden I had, I can't tell you how, how many hours I spent uh, each week doing that. So you won't have to worry about weeding. And because you're using, um, that beautiful soil probably won't be bringing in a lot of weed seeds either. Um, the height of the planters allows me easy access to get to these uh, plants. Uh, I don't have to check for bugs or disease or whatever by crawling around on the ground. It's a little harder for those bunnies to get up to get my, to get my vegetables. Although I, I did have one time have a woodchuck that had no problem climbing that wall. Um, but you can use, this is a great way to um, use a small space, I suppose, or a space that's, you know, you have a lot of deer. Uh, you can use a patio or a, a deck. So you can put your plants up on that deck and hopefully the, the woodchuck and the deer won't climb up on your deck to get them, but you will have uh, some protection uh, from that. So I can, you know, I can check these plants regularly and I can find things like this, which are uh, squash bug eggs. And uh, you see that they've, these lovely little, uh, actually, I think they're quite pretty, these eggs. And uh, they're hatching the little nymphs and they're sucking on those leaves. They're gonna suck all the juice out of the leaf. And they're going to, um, that leaf's gonna come nice and crispy brown. And then you won't have anything to produce food for your, for your um, plants. Uh, the other thing I don't have to worry so much about is the soil uh, trying to uh, uh, beef up my soil. I had terrible clay soil. The topsoil had all been taken off and I had terrible clay soil, so I would have to amend it. It would have taken me years to get the soil really well. So putting in the pots has really helped me uh, uh, get on with planting without having to spend years amending the soil and also worrying wondering what's in that soil uh, that the builder might have left. I don't have to flip it. I don't have to rototill it. Uh, I don't have to do anything to the soil uh, like that. Although I guess most people don't do so much of that anymore, but I don't, I don't have to worry about doing any of that. Uh, and there's much more time from enjoying all these wonderful things in, in, in the garden. Um, so let's recap. Okay. So for containers, the bigger the better. Make sure that you have adequate drainage. You don't want the plant roots to be sitting in water, so you want to make sure that you have good drainage. Light and fluffy soil. Get some kind of a good mix. Spend the money, get a good mix. You're going to, you're going to use that soil uh, for a number of years, and um, so, so buy something decent. Remember to fertilize. Uh, make sure that some people like to fertilize, you know, once a month or something. I think a small amount every once in a while is a better idea. Know the plants 
spend some time looking up uh, either bush varieties or varieties that are smaller so that the, they will grow better in the containers and make sure you give them room. Don't try to put a bunch of them in one pot because they're just not gonna do that well. May, remember that they need lots of sunlight. And when you water them, remember that morning is best and try not to wet those leaves. Okay, well, thank you so much for, uh, for listening. I hope I didn't put anybody to sleep. I hope there's some questions. <laughs> Well, thank you, Nancy. That was fantastic. <clears throat> if anybody has a question, uh, you can type it in the chat box. And Marcy, you want to go through the questions? Oh, sure. Well, okay. we can, I can do it if you want. No, we can. We can. I can go. Okay. Nancy, uh, Nancy did a great job, and I want to say thank you to Nancy. Uh, it was a well. pleasure to listen to as I sit here watching the snow come down and accumulate. <laughs> well, it is spring here in North Carolina, <laughs> so you have about another five weeks. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that part wasn't funny. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so I'm um, starting the chat box here, and you kind of covered the first one. It says, can containers be plastic, and do you need to replace the soil every year? Do you want to comment on that? I think you kind of covered it. Uh, oh, I will just go over it again because I do talk fast. Um, I do not replace the soil every year. Uh, some sites, websites do recommend that, but I think that they're just trying to sell more soil. Uh, this is seven years that I've been doing this. And like I said, I've only had one issue where the plant did not do well and I got rid of the soil and the plant and everything. Plastic pots are fine. You can use them. Um, I just beware that the really thin, cheaper ones will last you maybe one season. Okay. Um, so this person says that it's an inspiration for when I downsize and thanks you. Oh, okay. It is an inspiration. Um, can you leave cement planters out in the winter? Uh, you can. And the uh, ceramic one, uh, well, you talk about ceramic ones they some of them are frost proof they're labeled frost proof but uh, with the with the um cement ones i would try to i personally i would try to cover them because if you have something that's solid you know solid ice in there a lot of a, a water gets in there it, it might uh it might do some damage but it it should not because uh, they're thick enough they're very thick walled the the cement ones Great, thank you. Do you want All to right. stop sharing your screen, Nancy? <clears throat> yeah. Do you want to stop sharing your screen? Oh, yeah. Should I? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, there we are. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi. All right, so let's see, where am I now? Um, would you recommend, I'm not going to say this right, Osmocote as a fertilizer? Is that right, Osmocote? Yeah, sure. That's a, that's a... Um, uh, slow release. Yeah, that's yeah. a slow release. Yeah, I would do... <clears throat> Slow release. Okay. Do you rotate your planter to prevent disease in plant families? Have you found that containers have more or less disease than the beds that you previously had? I would say they have less disease because I'm using uh, the soil that I'm using started out with is a soilless mix. Now, of course, I've had it for that many years. So there are, you know, there are insects and uh, diseases and things that have blown in or whatever. Um, and the first part was, do I rotate? I, I do remove this, like I said, about half the soil out of the, the larger pots and uh, throw that in that big bed. So I'm kind of mixing all those, all those things together. The, as far as rotation, sometimes rotating the crops is first because you don't want to use I have the same crops that are pulling the same nutrients out of the soil year after year that depletes them. But in this case, uh, I'm fertilizing, you know, constantly, constantly, you know, weekly fertilizing. So I don't think the, there's probably some micronutrients that I'm missing, but that's, that's kind of getting way in the deep weeds. <laughs> uh, do you have an issue with deer where you are growing in containers? I do not. I have deer in the um, in the winter time. In the summertime, they seem to stay away. I have more issues with bunnies. So the next person, nice segue. The next person says, 
Do you have any ideas for deer and rabbit protection for containers? Um, I guess you could, you know, put uh, use the uh, deer guard that that netting, that black netting, and you could form um, if you uh, put some stakes up or something. You could, you know, you can enclose it like that. Put stakes into the like four stakes into the uh, around the pot, and then wrap it around with the deer guard. I mean, that, I do that for for uh, plants uh, in the winter time. So I could imagine that you could you could try doing it there. The bunnies are another issue because they're really hard to uh, um, to control and keep and keep away. Uh, again, uh, the deer guard works on that. I actually use little piece. Well, I'll get into this little pieces of deer guard um, and skewers when I plant my zinnias in my other part of my garden, and I cover put the deer guard over it, just a little tiny little piece of deer guard. It keeps the bunnies from eating it and the plants get big enough and then the bunnies, you know, they could nibble around the bottom, but the plants at that point are big enough. I but think there's some, uh, some of the deer repellents are labeled for vegetable garden use. So you could spray, but you'd really want to make sure that you check the label. Right, I, I've never used those, but yeah. And my understanding is that they work for a period of time and then they don't, you know, the, the deer acclimate to it. So yeah, to speak, you'd have to re reapply it. And the other one that I thought of is one of our master gardeners swears by the Irish spring on a stick. Yes. Soap. So if you had a container, you could put a very attractive stick with an Irish spring bar <laughs> stuck on the top. That would be a nice addition to your overall look. Yeah, except for when it <laughs> rains, when the heavy downpours come. Yeah, and, last like, summer you suds. would have gone through, what, a couple bars a month? <laughs> yeah, 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 you've got soap suds on your plants. I'm sorry, I can't help, other than um, some kind of a little <clears throat> fence, you know, fenced area, or like I said, if you, if you have a deck that you could put the plants up on, on your deck, uh, or a raised, you know, porch or something, you can put them up there and, and, and grow them up there, certainly as long as they get enough sun. Uh, that's the issue. Um, have you been able to leave your large plastic containers out year round or just the stone type ones? Uh, no, those are plastic. The, the two that I showed with the uh, little covering on them, those are plastic. But again, we try to allow them to dry out as much as possible. And then we, you, we put a, uh, a pot from a hanging basket upside down in, into the larger container and cover it with a uh, tarp pieces of tarp and uh, the bungee cord. So we keep the moisture, the, the, the snow and the rain out of there. And um, I've had no problem doing that for years. When we finally, we finally, ding, let's, let's not move this. <laughs> yeah. um, so let's see, uh, someone's thanking you. Thank you so much for this excellent organized presentation. A great way to spend an hour Happy gardening, wonderful presentation. Uh, here's another one. Do you save your seeds that you don't use for the following year or do you buy new seeds? If so, the best way to save them. Uh, I do save the seeds because obviously I'm not planting a lot. So to buy a packet of seeds, uh, I save them. I keep them in a metal container uh, to try to keep them uh, dry. I There's certain things that just, you. Uh, you know, you need to rebuy. I've had some tomato seeds I've had for 10 years and they're still viable. You know, I only need a few. Um, you should keep them dry and you should keep them cool, you know, and package them in some either uh, some kind of plastic or some kind of um, metal container or something to, to keep them dry. But yes, I, I definitely reuse the seeds. Okay. Um, I, this person is a, more of a comment. I've placed pots on their side so the, for the winter so the freezing water and soil doesn't crack the pots. That's um, a good idea. Fantastic, fantastic presentation. Thank you, very informative. Someone says they're starting a landscape business and want some advice. <laughs> um, <laughs> can sum that up today. Um, and thank you, very informative. So everyone is and really enjoyed your presentation, Nancy. Well, good, I'm glad. Another thing I liked about your photos was that you really showed how the containers are integrated into the garden. 
you know, some of the containers are in the bed, some of the containers are on the patio, they're on the steps. They were used in a lot of different ways. They weren't just kind of lined up somewhere. They were attractively just, you know, part of the whole scene. So congratulations on that. It was a, you know, if you, I've, I've been to your backyard and it's a very attractive space, very well thought out. Well, thank you. It, it, and it takes a while, you know, it just takes a while. And, and I'll tell you the the big planters, um, it, years back before BC, um, the, the big box stores would put those big planters on sale in the fall because they were getting ready for the Christmas stuff and they wanted those things out of there. That's how we purchased those because those were, I would never spend that money, amount of money that those, um, and it, I guess a lot of people, same thing. They don't want to fill that with dirt or they don't want to figure out what to do with that. Um, so that's how I got a lot of those planters was basically, okay, that's on sale. Here we go. Um, but uh, it depends on, you know, some people like a lot of color. I think the color of the, the flowers and the, the leaves and, and the fruits and things are the things that I want to highlight versus the color of the, of the pot. But everybody has different, you know, everybody has a different uh, feeling about that. Super. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. So thank you, everybody that was here today. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, go get your snow shovel ready. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> now I'm I have so sorry. Oh, no. it is really snowing out there. It's snowing down, folks. So uh, spring good, is coming. Spring is coming. Yeah, it's actually a good day to sit and work on your seed order, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's those, right. Uh, and read, read carefully. Read, get those those uh, seeds for uh, uh, for uh, if you're doing containers. Look for the seeds that that. Uh, take up less space. Yeah, compact varieties. That's good, compact good advice. Yep. Bush type cucumbers and all those kind of things. Yep. Great, great. Okay. Nancy, you might find this interesting. So uh, at the high point we were had, uh, there's 87 of us logged on. Well, 84 plus us three. So we had a nice crowd today. Wow, okay, very good. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, David, for helping me. Thank you, Marcy, for helping. And thank you, David, for walking me through the technical part because that was the most nerve-wracking to me. <laughs> you did great. <laughs>